Welcome to McIntyre's Next Level Life Podcast, a place for entrepreneurs, leaders, and dreamers to awaken and be activated to their full potential. Are you ready to get out of the boat and experience your next level? Here's your host, Michael McIntyre. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How is, how are you guys doing today? Doing well. Doing really yeah, good. doing well, Robin. Good. I am so excited. This is, I think, the second or third time we've got gathered together to record and just share some thoughts and insights on specific topics that we know would benefit our clients and then just the community at large. And so I'm really excited about today because today we're going to have multiple topics. Uh, one first one we're going to start off with is you, Brecca. We're going to talk about, and I think I wrote down what you wanted to uh, just connect with, which is partnering with the Lord to protect your peace, safety, and energy and stewarding relationships. Wow. And I love that topic because mm-hmm. I think we don't, we have a, we have different relationships that not fall into different categories, but you give them certain access depending on who they are. So why don't you just share with us what your thoughts are, and then we'll just join in on your conversation. Totally. Thank you, Robin. Um, Yeah, I think this is such a timely topic because it doesn't matter where we're at in our life, what season we're in, um, you know, what career we are pursuing, relationships will always be relevant to us. So what I have really realized that, that God gives us relationships in our life either for our lifetime, for a season of time, um, and very specifically uh, for a reason, whatever that reason is. And letting Holy Spirit reveal that reason to Mm. you is really important. And now some relationships, you know, you just automatically know, okay, this is why this person is here. Uh, Thank you, God. Or, you know, this is a lesson. And Lord, what else do you want to teach me? Um, with from this person with this person, what do I have? What did you give me to impart to this person if there's mm-hmm. grace for that? So it is truly a partnership with Holy Spirit when you are dealing with relationships, especially conflict or relationships that are significant. And um, what I continue to talk about is being self-aware and knowing yourself knowing how you feel, even though feelings aren't everything, being aware of how certain people affect your energy, your mood, um, your outlook on the rest of your day. I can't tell you how many times I've been with people who I consider very close and dear to my heart. Um, Yet every time I leave, I feel just a sense of anxiety or depression or a lingering feeling of melancholy. Um, You know, just random things that you wouldn't normally feel during your day. Um, or maybe there are underlying struggles that that person may uh, bring out or they may be dealing with. And what's great to uh, the mindset you should be in is never to be in judgment, right? When you're dealing with these relationships, you want to have the grace and mercy of Jesus because you never know what someone's going through. And a great trick a great hack I'd like to call it is just to sit with Jesus for a moment and say, okay, Lord, please show me how you view this person, especially if you're struggling with them um, or consider them an enemy or a foe, someone that you don't necessarily mesh well with. Um, They may even be someone, a part of your community that everyone else loves. I know we all have that one person we can think of, right? And and it's really just a simple act of taking a moment and having God reveal something to you that you may have not expected that can really shift your heart Um, because it's more so for you. Uh, than for that person. And uh, eventually, you know, God will reveal if you need to make an impact or share something. Um, I I also like to remind people if they're around someone and they start feeling insecure, this has happened to me countless amounts of times. I'm around someone, I'm like, oh, I just, you know, I feel really down about myself. I really am doubting myself. I feel stupid. I feel embarrassed, whatever it is. And I, I have to sit back and think, okay, there could be um, there could be a possibility that that person is feeling those negative 
things as well. Mm-hmm. And we, you would never think because that person may act very confident. They may show up very bold in how they express themselves. Mm-hmm. But you never know what's going behind closed doors. That's why the partnership mm-hmm. with God is so important. Um, mm-hmm. also, knowing when to speak truth and knowing whether that's going to be productive or not. Now, this is a habit that is only going to be developed I believe over time, unless you have a crazy discernment gift from God, which it would be a huge blessing. But um, I know I, uh, I do have a gift of discernment, but it is a muscle that the Lord has had to continually work over and over in my life. And especially if you're someone who instantly distrusts people or instantly trust people, um, you know, if you have any of those extremes in your thought process to really take a step back, remove yourself from the situation or the person and just think of it from a Christ-minded perspective. So knowing when to speak the truth, I believe, um, you know, something that I've dealt with in my past is uh, being disrespected and just accepting it. Now, this is a huge a huge pain point or used to be for me and still it pops up every now and then and you just got to go back to the the truth of what god says right and you have to center yourself in his word and um you know i used to just think all right just just take it and 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 almost i i think a lot of people forget that there are literal physical responses that you get when you're disrespected you either freeze or you blow up or a, a various amount of things you know you you isolate whatever it is um and so to know yourself to know how okay this is typically how i react let me let me think about this situation. If this is a possible situation that's coming up, don't borrow trouble and make up scenarios in our head because I know we do that a lot as well. Yeah. Um, but really think through, hey, how could I how could I deal with this situation differently in the future? How can I walk away from this feeling positive or feeling productive, um, even if the other person doesn't respond in the way that we're expecting to? And to lay down expectations and to know that you are going into this conversation, this confrontation, this exchange, uh, this greeting, even in an acknowledgement, knowing that you are putting your whole self and your truth into that moment and not expecting anything from the other side. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I would just say letting go of expectations is huge. So if you guys have anything to add on to that. Self-awareness, you mentioned self-awareness, which is key. But one thing that I have found as well is not only asking the Lord, what's, what's, what is the bigger picture that I'm missing? Realizing that everybody has a story and there's always something going on behind the scenes and that a person react, is acting out of uh, what's going on in their world. So if you're getting that vibe or even that pushback or somebody disrespecting you, there's something in them. And it, I believe it says it in James 3, there's something that's warring within them. Mm-hmm. And to have grace for, for that, there's something going on that I am unaware of, but God knows. And how I react and respond in that moment matters. And mm-hmm. that actually helps create um, better relationships, foster better relationships. The other thing in um, business, what I have found as well is trying to understand if I, if I know the person well enough to know maybe what their personality type is kind, you know, I'm able to then understand how I can best communicate so that they'll hear me. That's yeah. right. Because we often communicate how, you know, just from our, our person, who we are. Wow. But if we can figure out how to communicate with that individual in a manner in which they will actually hear you. Yeah. Because we're not all the same. And so we have to pause and ponder that for a minute, too. So even when you're stopping and asking the Lord for insight, saying, how can I best communicate with this person? Rather than immediately responding, which is yeah. our, I think, our, our human behavior. That's what we want to do when things are happening or we're wanting to engage in a dialogue with somebody that maybe is not um, not in that close circle of ours or we're having a needing to have a challenging conversation to be able to to actually say okay how can I how can I say this where they'll hear me I just recently had that and I um, even saw 
wise counsel. I said, okay, this is what's happening and uh, got a, some really good feedback on how to communicate to where they're going to hear me or they're going to hear you because there's no point. You don't want, you know, if you don't really take that time to care about mm-hmm. the conversation or care about the other individual or the outcome, uh, then it, it could go really, really bad. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it's true. Yeah. So that's, that's my, my, I try to understand where the other person's coming from and then how can I speak in their language so they'll hear me instead yeah. of hear me. That's you know, so good, Robin. You're, you're making me think of some of my, I, I studied communications in school and uh, which feels like a very long time ago, but I remember communications 101 um, as a 19 year old, like it, the first thing we talked about was what you're what really what you're talking about and um, communication models where what we think we're saying could be different from what we're saying. And then there's this gap between us and the person we're speaking to, which includes historical context, um, Mm -hmm. like life traumas, how they think of connotations of a word compared to the way you think. And so the message that ultimately started in your mind, what you are trying to say, there are so many, it's like that, what is that game telephone? Like yeah. if we think about the way, the amount of things that it needs to pass through for the message you mean to communicate to the message they actually receive, body language, right? Body language is, you know, what is it? I think 85% of communication, it might even be 90% is nonverbal. Um, communication of space, if you're having a difficult conversation at work, let's say you're a boss and you are behind a desk and have that person sit in front of your desk, that communicates something very differently than pulling your chair around and sitting next to them. Um, There's all of these little ways that we can think about um, how are we communicating our message? Is it actually, is it, is the message we're actually trying to communicate the one that's being communicated? And I think when we when we think on hard conversations, that trust to give someone the benefit of the doubt that they might actually be trying to listen and receptive to the message we're trying to communicate, it's actually something in our communication or the context or the context that's creating, you know, that that misunderstanding or or even that barrier to actually get on our message through. Um, yeah, so, so I, I remember that that really struck me. Um, I think there's also, you know, two, two other just kind of nuggets of wisdom that I think I've gained over the years or heard and kind of like been like, okay, that's going on the shelf to pull off when I need it. Yeah. Like, conflict is an opportunity for intimacy. Like I think in whatever relationship it is, whether yeah. it's in business, like I, I know um, I'm very familiar with Israeli uh, business practices. And, um, often Americans will go, uh, will go out there, whether it's an acquisition or whatever it is, they'll go into an Israeli meeting and there's all of this yelling and screaming and like almost like battle. And it's like the meetings are a war room where it's, but everyone's heard. That's the thing. Everyone's heard it and they actually like truly fight for their opinions. Like it's like, there's no, there's no, I don't care. It's no, what, like it's, this is the place to dissent in the war room. This is actually the place to dissent. And when we leave, we leave unified, but this is your opportunity. So um, don't like when we leave this room, this is where we're going. Wow. Um, yeah. um, and it's like, it's an opportunity to actually move forward. And I think like without, I don't, I don't think it's the yelling and the screaming that is the, that's the point. It's the point right. that everyone gets to actually express what they need to express. Yeah. Um, and if we would take that even in a personal standpoint, like we would just move so much further. Um, and it makes me think, you know, the one other piece of uh, wisdom uh, that someone shared, or I, I read it somewhere, I can't remember where, but it was uh, the quality of our life is directly correlated um, by the number of hard conversations we're willing to have. And I think that is so true. Um, It's so true. Like we get stuck so often just because we're afraid to have difficult conversations. Um, That might even just be a sales conversation. It might be like sales can be a difficult conversation because we are interrupting someone's data ask. Like 
like the ask is difficult. You might never make a cold call because it's not fun. That's a difficult conversation. It's difficult to be hung up on. It's difficult um, to be rejected. But those are the conversations we need to have. And then it's a difficult conversation to say no to something that might be really good, but it's not great. That's not actually serving your life. Um, right. And so when we're willing to have those conversations, um, we can foster better relationships. And frankly, we can prune some of the ones that actually are stealing our peace yeah. and our joy. That's so good. Sam, I, I want to say when you were talking about the Israel, you know, example, I, I felt chills because I honestly feel when I hear that, I feel understood. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, so, and, 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 and not in the way of, you know, being extremely aggressive, but, um, what, what would you say? I, I think this is something that I, you know, ha have had to work through a lot. What would you tell people who've had a similar experience to me that have, they want to go, they want to, they want to go deep and sure. they want to maybe get a little loud about it. Yeah. So, um, what do those people do when they are in relationship with people who get offended by that? Sure. Or don't want to just plain don't want to go there. Yeah, I think you know, in, in a company culture, it's it's part of the culture, right? It's and, and it's it starts if you're a leader, you know. It, well, you can serve in leadership whether you're in a leadership position, but it definitely starts with having a common objective in a in in a relation or in a relationship. Yes, but in a conversation, because if you don't, if you can't see it as everyone coming on one side, trying to solve a problem, then you see each other on opposite sides of a conflict um, of a problem. And actually that's then the point at which I think offense can happen because it's someone wins, someone loses versus a thought that we all win or we all lose. That if we have a very clear vision, um, very clear vision, very clear mission, objective for a conversation, then it, the point is not for your opinion to be heard. The point is to win, you know, as a group, as a group. Yeah. And you either trust the people in the room or you don't. And if, frankly, if you think no one else's ideas are any good, um, like you probably shouldn't be in a room, you yeah. know, with those people. Like we have to have trust on teams that we're all pulling in the same direction. We have to have trust in relationships that we're all pursuing intimacy with. Um, if that doesn't exist and we haven't communicated that expectation, um, then I think that's, that's where difficulty comes. Now, yeah. I think having the conversation with someone of saying, I want to pursue intimacy with you, that for me, that is going to require that I can express deep things. And that's not to push you down. It's to elevate our relationship. Um, and that might be difficult and working through that might take grace and time and practice and even easing into it. But I do think that sort of conversation, it can feel awkward, but the intentionality can set a foundation for, for where you want to go. Totally. Thank you for that. That's really good. I think That's people deal with that constantly. Everyone, not everyone, but we all tend to have a certain quirk about our communication and, um, to be able to match other people's Robin, as you, as you said, is, uh, it's selfless and it's something that we don't initially think about, but yeah. could make the difference of the outcome, you know, to where we can all end up on the same team. So Absolutely. thank you guys for taking that to the next level. I mean, that was, that yeah. was really amazing. Yeah. I just, um, one thing that years ago, uh, Lisa Turkhurst said that just resonated with me still does reaction determines reach. Mm -hmm. It's so important for us to, um, understand how, and even be proactive. How are you going to respond in any given situation? So if you're going to have to have a difficult conversation, you really have to realize that how you react is going to determine the outcome or the reach or how you're going to be in relationship with that person. And the other thing that you were talking about too, and then we can, we can move on is um, you were talking about the circle of people. So we have people that we hold close and those are very, very few people that are like 
all in 100 percent. It might be your spouse, might be your kids, uh, you know, a couple of maybe really good friends that know everything. You can tell everything to you can yell and you come out and still love each other. And then you have another circle of people that you only allow so much access to. So it's almost like this 360 degree. If you're going to look at a business, it's the, you know, the C-suite or whatever. And then it's the management team and then it's the employees. And so you have these different levels of, uh, of relationship with people. And so really knowing, is this a person that I'm, I I really want to be in relationship for a lifetime? Is this a person that is fulfilling a, a space right now, but I'm not sure, you know, and then you can determine how you can, um, what access you're going to give them. Cause I think one of the things you're talking about is access, access to you and who you are. And that, um, as well as you gaining other people's uh, access from other people as well and developing, like Sam was saying, that intimate relationship. So I think we all want to be in those relationships. Um, and we just don't like to have to have the conversations that get us there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <Right>? It's true. <laughs> Very true. Hey, so Sam, we we're going to like switch topics and <laughs> Bet you somehow or other, it's all going to tie in in the end. I'm sure. I'm okay. sure. But the one thing that you said you really wanted to talk to about today was to know your numbers, you know, and uh, why is it important to know those measurables? And, you know, we're all about uh, achievement and goals and uh, yeah. achieving our goals. Uh, and the key deal uh, to that is uh, our measurables or our numbers. So yeah. I'll just share about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll share a little bit and then we can have a conversation around this. Yeah. I think, um, gosh, I remember being a young entrepreneur and being like, I don't want to deal in numbers, right? Like math burns so many people. And if you started a business often, you're like, I'm a visionary. I need a numbers person. And so you avoid numbers like the plague because yeah. it, you, you're frankly, you're probably thinking about accounting. Uh, you're, you're thinking about having all sorts of, you know, spreadsheets and, and all of that. Um, yeah. and that's all amazing. Um, and actually I think one of the greatest things I've learned in my time as an entrepreneur, um, very practically was I took a beginner Excel course for mm-hmm. business. Um, and I actually, I can't recommend that highly enough. Okay. Um, it doesn't take that long. Um, and it is a invaluable tool, even just for creating a platform from which to know your numbers. Um, but I think knowing your numbers in general is this idea that we give we give attention to the things that we measure. Um, when we when we have the intentionality of measuring things, um, we actually start to see a difference. Um, you know, this is as simple as um, for for a salesperson. You know, I think it's funny because again, as a young entrepreneur, I wanted to avoid sales like the plane too. It was like numbers and sales, like let me be in operations and culture and people. And, you know, and I realized like everything sales, you know, if you're a business, it's relationships, relationship too, you know, and, and I know uh, Michael talks all the time about everything is sales. Everything is enrolled. It's, it, that's so critical. And that does tie into our relationships. But I think um, as a sales coach, you know, I had, uh, I had about, 50 different salespeople, business owners that I coached um, in, in one of my previous roles. And we had a robust system for understanding what their pipeline of business was and how much business, you know, there's a really uh, well-known phenomenon in the sales world known as the, the 90 day rule. And the 90 day rule is that basically your sales today have come from the last 90 days of your prospecting efforts. Yeah. And so if you are doing any sort of financial planning, looking at growth, understanding, you know, the, the lifeblood of your business, um, it's sales and you need to have a good sense of what's coming in, what's in, what's in your pipeline, you know, what's, what's fresh, like new, new leads, even cold leads. Like if, if you have only warm leads soon, you're going to be 60 days into your 90 days. You're going to get to a fresh 90 days and all of a sudden, and of course, that's a rolling 90 days. Um, but if you take a month off from new leads, um, you're going to feel that at some right. point. And so having a system where you actually understand, um, well, yeah, you understand what's coming through and you are, we're, we're about getting better here too, about improving. If you don't measure your conversion, 
If you if you don't say I made a hundred calls this yeah. month and this many sales resulted from it, we actually don't know if we're getting better. Um, it could be chance. It could be complete chance that you know one one particular month we get more sales and we say, well, look, you know, it's we have to have a system where we actually measure the things in our business that matter the most. Now, if you're a solo entrepreneur, solopreneur, um, really you've got to hone them in because trying to measure too many things at one time is also completely overwhelming. Yeah. Um, you obviously like very, very basic. You've got to measure revenue. What are your sales? Are your sales growing? Are your sales shrinking? You have to understand and understand that pipeline of sales. Um, what is, what are your leading indicators versus lagging indicators, right? So, so to throw out for some people a new, new terms, right? Sales is lagging. We can't just measure sales and understand how well our business is doing um, because our input or leading measures, how many sales calls are you making? How many, um, how many meetings are you booking out of those sales calls? Um, are you stopping by offices? Are you showing up at networking events? Are you building relationships that are leading to sales? We need to understand how that works. That's true in marketing as well, right? If you're doing paid ads and you're just throwing money and you don't have an idea of an improving yeah. metric <laughs> there, um, you know, it's, we, there's, there's a problem there. There's a real problem and we can actually be reinvesting. We can be investing in our business and getting a very poor return um, because we don't know our numbers. Right. Um, so that's top line revenue. We've got to have a good sense of that top line. We have to understand, um, obviously, our profit. What is the profit at the end of the day? What is the number that's coming through? And really importantly in there is what's in between, what's in between our sales and what's actually left. Um, and if you're not a business owner or in business at all, this is actually a really good way to think of this. Like money is all money in, money out, whether it's a business or it's personal expenses, yep. um, you know, or just personal finance. We have to understand what is our income as a business, as, a, as an individual, is it growing? Is it shrinking? Um, and then what is, uh, what's in between and what's left? Um, one of the best things I've ever heard kind of in terms of numbers is we often think again, both personally and in a business is like, how do we, how do we grow what's on the bottom line? How do we grow what's on the mm -hmm. bottom line? Yeah. And it, are we going to be profitable? And I heard something that completely changed my perspective on this is that profitability is intentional. Profitability mm -hmm. is planned. Instead yeah. of working top down, work bottom up. Yeah. It's like, if you want to have a profit, you need to know what are your expenses and how much sales do you need to do in order to make that profit? Or frankly, if you know your sales and you've planned for profit, what can you afford to spend? And that is a completely different approach than saying, well, these are all my expenses. I better match the sales so that I have a profit. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, we are going to have a profit. Yep. And so this is what we can afford. And now knowing our numbers, we need to optimize those expenses so that it does lead to really good sales. Um, so I think that's just critical. Again, I think in sales, and I apologize for bouncing around a little bit, um, you would never have... There's no athlete in the world that doesn't know their numbers, right? Not an athlete in the world. And that is one of the best microcosms for us to look at people that are constantly improving. Um, if we don't measure improvement, um, well, let me say this. If we don't measure key metrics and those might be different for different roles for sure, then we just don't have a solid foundation to measure improvement. Um, and again, don't measure too many things. One of the most important exercises is to define what are the key activities that I should be doing every day that drive my business forward, that drive my life forward, even if it's for a quarter of the year, like I want to lose weight. Okay, great. What are the metrics that are going to get me to that goal and how am I tracking? And that doesn't have to be this complex thing, um, yeah. but it should be in front of us consistently. And we need to get very clear on what are those that actually get us there. And that's one thing a coach can really, really help define. Yeah. I love that, Sam. Really good.
Yeah, that's, uh, you know, and as you were talking, we were talking about uh, like Maxwell, John Maxwell is the law of the scoreboard. You need yeah. your numbers, like you know, you need to know, um, and you need to know the other team's numbers as well. Right? Yeah, you do. But one of the the things is uh, when you were t- starting to talk about the talk- topic, because it's part of, I look at it just from the coaching standpoint of helping people achieve their goals. And so often, like one of the things most of our clients, the clients that I deal with, they want to lose weight. They want to be healthy. Well, yeah. there is something in that we can be very specific, very measurable. And uh, we're talking about smarter goals, which is specific, um, measurable, achievable, um, yeah. risky. Because if you're, you know, in whatever you do, even in business, uh, time key. So what by yeah. when? So you yeah. need to put a date on it um, that it has to be exciting and relevant. So in all of the, even in business, you want to have those smarter goals and you have to have your measurables. You know, one thing that Andy Stanley says too is do an autopsy, autopsy on your success. Mm. So find what is working really identify. It's the same thing when you're looking at counterfeit dollar bills or, you know, you, you know, the real one. So intimately you can identify, right? So same thing with doing an autopsy on your business to finding out when something works and goes really well and is successful. Why, why did it work? Why was it successful? And then you can take that. And like you were, I I so uh, see the picture of the business pipeline and measuring and um, your you can't project even the winning if you don't know your scoreboard, if you don't know your numbers or your measurables, and you have to have all of those numbers. What, what's, why are you winning? Why are you not winning? Yeah. I think that the more you can measure when you're doing well helps you identify when you fall off track. Absolutely. It's like when you're losing, when you're wanting to lose weight and you're wanting to lose X amount of pounds, it's 30 pounds in six months. Okay, well, now we have a date and how are we going to do that? And let's back it up. Begin, like you were saying, with the end in mind or the yep. bottom up. Absolutely. And so I think that's key in um, in having those measurables, knowing your numbers and, um, and just knowing uh, like, when I was in sales selling insurance, I knew how many calls I had to make to be able to get one face to face with yep. a client. How many of those did I have to have to actually get the policy written? Right. Yep. And so, and then, you know, just really saying this is how many calls every single day, breaking it down. This is how yeah. many today I have to make in order to make that income. Yep. So, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Robin, I, and I, I love that you're bringing it back to fitness too, because I know that that's been, yeah. that's been a habit of, of mine for a very long time. And, and there's a couple of things like one, I know most people drastically underestimate the calories they eat, oh, drastically yeah. underestimate. Um, and I think actually getting a handle on that, like one of the things that made a huge difference for me um, was weighing, getting a, getting a food scale and actually weighing my food for, um, for just a couple of weeks. Like that was not, I, I don't do it anymore, but getting a sense and really learning that was huge for me. That was information that gave me a lot of power yep. in terms of understanding that. Um, and, you know, that that's made again, a huge, huge difference. And the other thing for me is as I've weight trained and, and all of that is if I'm not tracking my weights, I, it, it's not even necessarily when I, that I miss the improvement. It's that if I ever go backwards, yeah. then I'm going, oh, I've been training for a while. Now all of a sudden I'm not lifting as heavy. Why? And yeah. that might actually indicate that I've overtrained that my body needs a break. Um, and the older I get, I realize there's a lot of injury prevention involved too. Yes. And it's like, if I'm just trying to push my numbers higher and I never notice that, oh, for two weeks, you haven't been able to lift as heavy. Like I might miss that my body desperately needs to lay off just a little bit yep. to to actually go. So that that's that's been very practical for me. Yeah. yeah. Even in health, you have to know your numbers. You have to you have to have a gauge. You have to be able to identify when you're off, when something isn't working, so you can put the correction in. Absolutely, yeah. and and re- there's a constant reevaluation of all of that as well. Business Absolutely, as, well as personal. Yeah, yeah. Brecca, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. <laughs> so this is all great. I love that we are breaking out of the. You know, you you can't you don't just have to measure your numbers in business. It can be in life. It can be you know in social media. It can be business too. Measuring uh, social yep. media growth. I, I think a lot of people that is such a is such yeah. a struggle because it's 
okay, well, what, okay, so you can use a, you can use a scale for weighing your food for fitness, right? What kind of tools can you use for social media to grow yeah. your social media? How, you, you've really got to figure out ways to be creative and break the norm of, um, well, this is what this says on the app and, you know, but what if you just start tracking, okay, these are the things I say during this post. These are yeah. the, yep. this is the background <laughs> of my, of my video, of my photo. Um, and these get more likes, these get, um, more comments or these get less, whatever. And so just noticing trends, yeah. um, is also really important with, numbers and 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 noticing just like the little nuances that you normally wouldn't um yeah. and not just looking at one factor not just looking at oh well this got so many likes or um this got um way more comments than it did shares whatever it is really paying attention to the nuances and seeing what key factors you can integrate into your fall into your um upcoming posts or you know yeah. whatever it is even if it's your website on your um for your business or um you know yes. with your job w yeah. what responses you get and really you know maybe investing into analytics and finding someone who knows what they're doing and can look at the back side of things um if that's where you are you know if yeah. that if your business um you know if you're if you're able to do that, if you're able to yeah. invest. So I think that's yeah. great. I love knowing your numbers. That always gets me excited. Yeah. Um, and when you look at it as a positive, as a way to grow rather than a way to necessarily, uh, you know, to cut back or to be conservative, even though that is necessary. Yeah. Uh, sometimes if that's not what you're naturally drawn to, get yourself excited with knowing that, all right, I'm going to keep track of these numbers to grow. You yep. know, and then and then you'll get to learn to love the whole process. Yeah. Rob and I have a couple of closing thoughts, even just on that topic, Absolutely. maybe to, to put a bow on it. You know, oh, I think yeah. um <laughs> I, I think I think when when you don't know your numbers, it's harder to celebrate your wins too. Yes. Like yeah. knowing your numbers actually really lets you celebrate wins because you know when you've reached a goal. Like yep. like having that well, what by when. Like oh if that's numeric and you've hit a number, like it's actually really easy to say, yep, I hit it. Yeah. I hit that number. Um, and, and then again, again, kind of leading indicators, think of that as your process. Like, because sometimes we yeah. only celebrate wins when we could, that that's a lagging and we can celebrate improvement and leading. And then one last thing I'm going to say is I think people could be hearing this and saying, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. Like this is <laughs> hard work. And actually- Here's the truth. It is a lot of hard work, like, yeah. but that's the difference between people that are going to be succeeding. Like what, what is the price that you're willing to pay to succeed in what God's called you to do? You know, and, and that's, we're not here to talk about how to be ordinary. No, you don't need to do this. Like mm -hmm. you, you don't need to do this. You get to do this in, in process of reaching like high, high, high goals. Yeah. And I think it ends up being something that just becomes a part of what you do and it does. pay attention to. And it's no longer hard work. It's just establishing the pattern of behavior, right? And, yeah. you know, with your saying that too, I, and I'm going to, it's going to be a, a shameless plug for uh, Michael Hyatt and the full focus. Planner, <laughs> but, but I use the full focus planner. And so you, I have my goals, but then I also, they have a page where you detail it out. And so yeah. you write down specifically those measurables. And yeah. then what are you going to do when you get there? So it even has a place to write down, how are you going to celebrate? And then they've got tools within that that help me track and be self accountable to that. So I'm always checking on a weekly basis, my, numbers as it were in whatever area um of goal whatever goal it is that i have yeah. so yeah i i that's, that's something i just highly recommend you've got to set a system in place as well uh for you to know that know know that you're actually moving forward yeah because a lot of people operate still in stagnation and procrastination and in default and they're not yeah. in their life by design so yeah so uh, now we're talking about numbers. We're going to move to kind of like numbers, the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, Michael talks often about the matrix 
And I didn't, I had not seen the movie. I saw the movie 25 years ago when it came out. I saw it for the sci-fi and the special effects of it without really uh, paying a lot of attention to the message in the movie. And so because we started talking about it when I was in Dallas uh, a couple weeks ago, I it dawned on me, I need to watch this again because there's a lot that I missed. And so I sat down and I watched it. And ultimately, I wanted to talk about not just the movie, but the message in the movie, which is how we see things and how we think. Because really, um, there's um, he he talks about, you know, the red pill and the blue pill. Which pill are you going to take? Are you going to take the one that's going to kind of keep you right where you are, which is the blue pill? Or are you going to take a risk and and take the red pill that's going to actually propel you into the world that you are? We're born and created to live in. And yeah. once you choose, there is no going back. And yeah. in that, um, it says, uh, yeah, like one has a future and one does not have a future. So there were some meaningful moments in that, that it reminded me that um, how we think, how we think about everything we've talked about, relationships, money, m- numbers, how we think and how we see things determines our reach or determines our progress or determines are we living with intentionality or not? Because mm-hmm. we have all been raised, you know, to think of ourselves. We place labels on ourselves based on our school, our parents, our friends, just our experiences, our hurts, and all of the things that we've experienced in our life form how we see things. But what if we took the red pill and began to see things differently, began to challenge the way that we think? think and begin to think differently and begin to realize that we were born for so much more than the world has actually told us or the labels that we put on us, the things that we have in our head that say that maybe we're not enough or we did everything, all the right things. We went to school, we got a degree, we got married, we got a job, and then that's it. You know, that's the, actually the matrix, that's kind of like this deception that we could and most do live in for the majority of their lives. And, you know, when I, but we can change it. Here's the good news. We can take the red pill and change how we think. We can take the red pill and change the life that we're living if we're willing to take the risk. You know, when I first became a Christian, I was a really a very negative person. And um, I was always waiting for the next shoe to drop. Bad things always happen. So I, I was like that guy um, in a pig pen. There was always this cloud, yeah. right? That was always <laughs> there. And, um, and you see that a lot in people right now, uh, just really trying to get their bearings after the last few years. You see that in people. And I, I realized there's something I have to do. I have to retrain how I think I have to do something. And it could be, it was a simple thing, but I thought, okay, I'm just going to start uh, putting words or phrases on sticky notes and I'm going to stick them on my mirror. And every morning I'm going to say them. I don't, I, even though I don't believe them, I'm going yeah. to say them. And so I did that. And that is really the beginning of me coming out of that matrix that I was living in to step into a whole new world, into a whole new life that is bright and vibrant and exciting. And to be able to see beyond what I see, there is so much that we um, we have uh, blinders on that we keep ourselves from seeing, even as uh, successful as we are in fa- in our family, in our relationships, in our businesses. There's still blinders. There's still so much more that I believe God wants to open up to us if we're willing to step into something new and take that risk. Mm-hmm. So in the movie, Neo has two names. He has one that the world put on him. And then he has one that actually was who he was born and created for. And he yeah. had to choose. And people in the world, friends, family, people in the matrix 
talked to him, kept telling him, no, wait a minute, this is who you are. This is who you've been. This is the person you are. But his higher calling was, nah, you are chosen. And I guess I want to say to everybody that they are chosen. They are the ones that have been chosen for this moment in time if they are willing to take the red pill and step into that matrix. You know, um, one of the things that was so interesting too in the movie, uh, the, and this is what the matrix, matrix represents a system of control that operates completely in the mind. Um. Hmm? which reminded me of the locus of control, which is a very old concept, but there's people that think that they can control everything. And then there's people that think the world around them controls everything. Yeah. And we have to uh, look at how are we viewing and perceiving the world around mm-hmm. us and shifting our mindset to realize that the other things that we can, I, I, don't, I don't like using the word can control. I'd like to use the words partnering with the Lord. There yeah. are things that we, you know, he's in control and we can partner with him because he's given us things that he wants us to do in that partnership. Right. Yeah. And then there's things that there's, and you guys probably all know people like this, that everything around in the world is why I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing now. We see it. Uh, I want to, maybe it's a victim mentality, but we see it a lot nowadays when reality is you can change anything. You know, the whole point I think in the movie was, is that there's, it, we can reach impossibility. There's impossible things out there that we think are impossible that are absolutely possible if we are willing to take the risk. So those yeah. are just some of the points I think that stood out to me. Um, we place borders and boundaries around our thoughts and around our lives. And yet um, what God says is he says, never doubt God's mighty power to work in you to accomplish all of this. Mm. He will achieve infl- infinitely more than your greatest request. Anything that we could hope or dream for, he will give us more than we even can conceive. Your most unbelievable dream and, ex- um, and exceed your wildest imagination. That's the life we're supposed to be living in every single day. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. I think that living in a different, shifting our mindset, changing how we think, being excited and expectant for the impossible makes life exciting and energizing. But we have to change how we think and how we see. So good, Robin. Wow. You laid that out beautifully. And uh, for someone who's heard so much about the matrix and just different ways of looking at it, I feel like that was expressed in such a authentic, but also I just related to it when you said it, it was beautiful. And what came to me when you were talking is um, something that I believe society today is driven by, and that's fear and choosing to let go of that and I I'm I'm on social media and I am able to speak to strangers uh through live streaming and I constantly tell everyone I go you guys there is there is a there is a way out of anxiety there is a way out of depression and you know Jesus is bigger than whatever you're dealing with um and and a lot of people just don't know that there's another way besides fear and control um so just bringing that awareness and and beautifully laying it out like you did uh it's just a blessing to hear again and and hear it a new way um yeah yeah i feel like there was something else but uh sam do you have any perspective on it yeah i think robin as you were as you were speaking well so two things Rebecca, as you were speaking it reminds me even in the matrix how they're you're plugged in like, yeah. and, I, and and so i think what thinking about what are you inputting into your mind mm-hmm. what what are the inputs yeah. you're allowing in because it's going to determine robin what uh, my thoughts uh based on what you were saying is the matrix is what we believe is true and what's not true right. and so our belief systems which live in our mind in our spirit yeah. you know in that connection um our, our beliefs about ourselves, belief for, about God, who he is, what he will do, and our belief around the, about the world around us, about others, about the world around us and how they affect us. Like that will determine 
it really will. It'll determine our internal life. And from there, uh, what we speak, what we do, yes. what are our habits, um, it connects to everything. Um, shame, shameless plug. I hope that's okay. I know <laughs> I've talked about it on the podcast before, but you know, I, I, I created a product called the Overcomers Journal. And yes. that, that's really the basis of yeah. all of it. Um, the Lord tells us to be transformed or that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. And yep. so often we, we like as Christians, we're like, hey, we've got all this behavior modification and we're not actually looking at, we're not actually looking and making the choice to say, what are the assumptions about what's true and what's not true around us? Again, about ourselves, about God and about the world around us. And I think starting, like for me, taking the red pill is, it's in one sense, it's, it's a one and done decision. It's like, once you've decided to go there, like you're there. And I think often that's accepting Jesus and Holy spirit, opening our eyes to what's yeah. around us and, and being in intimacy with the father being, you know, a new creation. Like you, you don't go back from that. Um, but at the same time, I do think there's a daily decision to actually question what our assumptions about truth yeah. are. Yeah. Um, okay. Like, I assume that's impossible. I assume that person has a problem with me. I assume that that business is too hard to start. And that keeps us in places that we don't want to be. Or or maybe we do just say, you know what? It's comfortable. Like stepping out of that requires us to actually challenge what we believe is true. And I'm not talking about the, the big stuff. Um, although I think dialoguing with the Lord, going to scripture, deciding. Actually, even that, that's a decision. Like wow. scripture is truth yeah. it, or, or our, our worldview and, and our, our mindsets, like if scripture is not true, then what's our foundation for truth? Like even that, that we have to know yeah. what yeah. we believe is true. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things that's been so incredible in, in my life and, um, you know, the reason that, that myself and my partners even created that, you know, the Overcomers Journal was saying a lot of the anxiety we feel, Bracky, you were talking about anxiety, a lot of depression that we feel. It's because we're, we're, we're believing things that aren't actually true. Um, yeah. it's, it's, we, yeah. we feel it in our bodies and ultimately yeah. what it comes back to, they might even be thoughts you know, we're having these thoughts and what's the layer, what's the layer beyond what we can see. That's actually, what are, what are we believing to be true? We've got to have to, have to, have to have a solid source of truth, which for, if, if you're a Christian and it's not scripture, I want to challenge like that. It's gotta be that, you know, um, because we'll, we'll get you know, scripture even says we will get, you know, just kind of blown with the wind of all sorts of, you know, just we'll get rattled with winds of doctrine with, yeah. you know, um, people that will claim that they're speaking from Holy spirit and it's mm -hmm. not grounded yeah. in a source of truth that we know that we know is true. And that can take us in so many negative places. Um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's when we actually start to unwind and transform the mind, um, which is really what I think the, the matrix is about. Like that's, that's how it hits me at least is, yep. is that's what allows us to then truly be transformed yeah. and become exactly what you're saying, become the person that God says we are, yeah. even if we don't believe we're that yet, right? you know, and, and it is going back to, I don't believe this is true, but this thing I believe is true says that it's true. Mm -hmm. Um, and submitting my own mind and my own conscience to, to that truth is so important. That's good. I think Sam on the, um, you know, whenever we, because we all do, right. You have those thoughts that pop into your mind. We have, like I said before, labels that have been placed on us that somehow we believe this to be true about ourselves. Yeah. And, and the practically when those things happen, we need to, if we could just pause for a moment and say, wait a minute, is that what God says? Yeah. Because I have the mind of Christ. And that's really where transformation comes from is when we recognize and realize we have the mind of Christ. Yeah. And if we just even speak that and say, okay, 
this, this is not in your word. This is not from you. So I have to reject it. You know, um, our pastor has a book out, been out for years called Mind Monsters. And you have to, he talks about, you know, recognizing these thoughts, mm -hmm. rejecting these thoughts, removing them, and then replacing them with God's thoughts. And that's really the key uh, to changing how we think about ourselves and the world around us. Yeah. You know, a couple of things says in the uh, in in the movie as well. The, there's a residual self image, so mm -hmm. we have this residual self image that we really do need to examine. And say, is this true mm -hmm. or not? And if it's not, I need to replace it with what's true. Yeah. And uh, the other part that really stood out, a couple, two things is uh, he says, uh, no, actually Trinity says, you've been down that road. Mm -hmm. And you know exactly where it ends. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. know that's not where you want to be. Yep. And the the shift is in, is in taking that red pill and changing how you think and just shifting how you think about yourself. And Morpheus says, free your mind of fear, doubt, and unbelief. And, uh, you know, he said it. I thought of the song, free your mind. So mm -hmm. free your mind. <laughs> Free your mind. And um, because I know that God has so much more for us than we even can recognize. So helping us to see what God wants us to see, think how he wants us to think because we have the mind of Christ and then be willing to step into it. Because what Michael says about the comfort zone over here, <laughs> where we stay in that comfort zone, ultimately becomes a grave if we don't. And it's time so for all of us to step into the, uh, into at step out of the matrix and into actually the real world that God wants us to live in. Yeah, totally. I just want to add one more thing onto that as someone who has lived with, uh, who is, uh, you could even say driven by resentment, mm. um, driven by bitterness and unforgiveness and realizing how much of a distraction choosing to side with fear and control mm -hmm. and impact your life. And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but I'm just saying when you real, when you take a step back and you receive the freedom and you take, you yeah. make a conscious decision to step out of that, you realize that you are letting those things control your whole. Yes. Girl. Yeah. And, and, and then I had it's to fun. ask myself, okay, this feels like once I kind of got to my senses, I'm like, all right, this feels like a distraction. What am I trying to distract myself from? And what, I, you know, and then I'm like, all right, um, I think I'm distracting myself from the true purpose that my life was called to, you know, go down. And, uh, and yeah. why am I being distracted? Why am I letting myself dis distract myself, even though I know the true reason of my purpose in life. And that's something you got to, you got to talk to God with, you've got to get down to the nitty gritty and, and um, let him tell you who you are and why, why you're doing what you do. And yeah. I know Sam always talks about the why, and that's how you yeah. get up in the morning, knowing your why. And it all comes yes. back to that and knowing that, Hey, I'm going to choose life. I'm going to choose the red pill. And yeah. there's, going back and and um and i i think it's something to be grateful for when you're on the other side when you're when you choose freedom and you choose real life to just reflect back and say wow you know i'm not letting anything control my life like i did before and i'm so grateful not and and not to ponder on the time wasted because right. you know, time learned yep. um, and and in ways that you can be a it can be a part of your testimony and to help other people out of that uh yep. it's so powerful so that's just good. as a personal testimony that's how i love that the whole matrix uh perspective has blessed my life and reflecting on it that's good that's so if you haven't watched the movie in a while, I highly recommend watching it again and looking at it from a different perspective and the message in the movie um, and uh, just realize that you were meant for more. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, any other final thoughts on anything we've talked about this morning that you guys want to share? 
Yeah, just one, I think one final thought for me, Rebecca, you were just talking about how I love talking about why, <laughs> knowing your why. And, yes. and, and it's funny because, you know, Robin, you were talking about the what by when. And I think one of the, one of my favorite things that I've heard from Donald Miller, and it was what by, um, what by when, because of why. Yeah. And we have that, you know, it's specific, specific, measurable what, Definitely. by when. That takes it from a goal to a mission. And it allows us to wake up with a sense of purpose because it's connected to a why. Um, yeah. And I think we're as believers, as Christians, we are called on mission. Yes. It's easy to just be like, you know what? This is about self-improvement. No, this isn't about self-improvement. This is about accomplishing a mission. That's it's so about true. accomplishing a mission yeah. in a kingdom that's real. Yeah. Um, and that's when I think about the matrix, like it, it, it takes that's it good. from, it takes it from just showing up. You know, and, and like you could self-improve in the matrix. Like actually most of our world is doing that right now. Yeah. Like they're having that, the, the conversation about self-improvement. Taking the red pill is not just about growth. It's about going from growing for the sake of whatever it is, fame, money, just the, the system of the world. Babylon, as it talks about like yeah. Revelation 18, like that system is going to crash. Like we are connected when we have that, why it connects us to that purpose. Yeah. We can wake up on mission and, and that is a different way to live. That is red pill. Yeah. And that's our mission. So when you're going back to the matrix, ultimately at the end, the mission is to call other people out of yep. sameness, out of comfort, out of self-improvement. Yep into an entirely different way of living life. Absolutely. And that's our mission, isn't it? As coaches, absolutely, that, that we live, we live to serve people and be a part of that life transformation and really um, opening up that path and that road. So uh, we've talked about just uh, relationships, communication, numbers, the matrix, uh, with our coaches today. And we also mentioned the Overcomers Journal. I think Sam mentioned that full focus planner. Uh, we've mentioned yeah. Donald Miller. So we mentioned a lot of things. If anybody out there wants to connect with us and wants to know more, you can just go to the Mac, michaelmcintyre.com and connect with us. And we would love to have the opportunity to connect with you further, to maybe get into a coaching relationship with you that helps you take the red pill and stop living in the matrix. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. If you're ready to activate and accelerate your results, taking your life to the next level, we've curated several experiences just for you. And if you're ready to start living out your full potential in life and business, our team of professional coaches are ready to partner with you. To find out more about how you can get involved with the McIntyre team or participate in upcoming events, go to themichaelmcintyre.com. Thank you for listening to the Next Level Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share.